Hello and welcome to this week's group study and we are so privileged to have with us Bishop Sandy Miller uh, who along with Annette has been with us all weekend. We're so grateful for you to be with us Sandy. Oh it's been so lovely to be back here because I haven't been here really since work started. Wow. So I remember the building really which was a I think it was probably about to be demolished or somebody was yeah. suggesting yeah. it should be I think and then to see it now full of of uh, lovely people praising God and yeah. it's, it's just so moving the whole thing brilliant so we are going to look at John chapter 14 verse 15 to 16 and I'm going to read it to you I'll read the NIV and then I'll also read the message version uh, because it's such a great rendering and then the questions that we're going to get you to discuss us is this what does it tell me about Jesus what does it tell me about me and what can I share or show someone else so here's it in the NIV if you love me keep my commands and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever the spirit of truth the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And then here it is in the message. If you love me, show it by doing what I've told you. I will talk to the father and he will provide you another friend so that you will always have someone with you. This friend is the spirit of truth. The godless world can't take him in because it doesn't have eyes to see him, doesn't know what to look for. But you know him already because he has been staying with you and will even be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming back. So um, discuss this to begin with. What do these words tell us about Jesus? What do they tell us about us? And what can I demonstrate or share with someone else? If you love me, keep my commands. Um, Sandy, you spoke yesterday about this this uh, dynamic of our love turning into obedience for Jesus, but that that's not always straightforward. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how we, how that can feel and how we can um, um, move along in the Christian life? Yes, I I think. Uh, what I meant by that really was that the, the it's one thing to say that we love Jesus but if we know that Jesus has certain plans and hopes for uh, for the world and um, we decide not to take part in that it, it it throws a huge question mark on the extent to which the Spirit of God is influencing us mm -hmm. because um, Part of the call upon the Christian community, the Christian church, is to respond to the desire, the hunger of God to be um, a blessing to the world. And he uses us to do that. Hmm. So uh, to say, I love you, um, but <laughs> I'm not really interested in what you're interested in is a contradiction in terms. Yeah. And I think, of course it's hard because he asks sometimes things that doesn't suit us. He changes our plans from time to time. And that's, that's where faith comes in. Because we've already decided that we're going to go with Jesus. And we may need a little bit of help from time to time. And that's why small groups is such a blessing. Because we can help one another through it. Hmm. We can explain to one another what we think um, the Bible is encouraging us to do and to be and to go. and. Hmm. And you, you use the story of Edinburgh Zoo's gorilla and um, and uh, the gorilla costume, the man in the gorilla costume. You, you'll have to, if you didn't, if you weren't there yet on Sunday, do go and uh, listen to the talk to get the full joke. But there was this idea of sometimes we we kind of what, what do we do when the outside and the inside don't match up? Yeah. And um, I suppose the challenge is is that that Jesus makes a big ask of us, doesn't he, in his commands? There's there's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot in that, in the Sermon on the Mount, just, just in itself. Um, what do we do when we, f we find ourselves in that place? Well, I think we sometimes think that God has um, forgotten us. But I think the thing to remember is, you know, if, if God seems a long way away, the, the big question is, who's moved? 
because he won't have moved. He's, he's still there. And uh, that's the point, really, of the whole passage is it seems to me that Jesus knew that he was going to have to leave them, but they couldn't quite understand because if you live with Jesus for three years, you, you can't bear the thought of living without him. But he, he was going to have to leave them, but he was making plans to make sure that his influence and his, the personification of God, in a sense, can remain with us, all of us, everywhere, all the time. So that must be better, which is why he says it's better for you, for you that I go. But I will send you, and then the language he uses is, is very um, sympathetic, friendly, just like a parent with children, really. I'll send a friend. Hmm. It's not a schoolmaster. Not that there's anything wrong with schoolmasters, but it's not a, it's not a a, a difficult relationship. Yeah. And the perfection that Jesus is looking for is is in relationships. Yeah. As and he and the more uh, we uh, expect him to be the influence in our lives, the more he will be. Because you you spoke, I can't remember who the quote was, but if Jesus is first and foremost a teacher, or only a teacher, then all he can do is tantalise you with what you can never be. Yes, yes. So um, is there a sense that sort of obedience is supposed to push us to that place where we're we're like, oh, I can't do this? (laughs) Do you think it's... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's what Jesus means by blessed of the poor in spirit. Because um, it was George Matheson, actually, who was a minister in Scotland uh, in a, a parish in, 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 in Ellen, just outside Glasgow. And he went blind at the age of 21. And he, from our point of view, outwardly, he, he had a very hard uh, existence and a hard life. Um, I, I always love him because he was an inspiring man, really. He preached once in front of Queen Victoria at um, Crathy Church. And he took as his subject the trials tribulations of Job hmm. and Queen Victoria was so moved by his um, sermon with her own of course she lost Prince Albert and never really recovered um, that she uh, uh, ordered or asked for the uh, talk to be printed and hmm. circulated throughout the royal household and um, she was deeply moved by him and, and he had a huge influence uh, at that time in in, in Scotland um, so it was he who, who who makes that point. He, that is, you know, it's a story of the children of Israel, isn't it? That, that at, on Sinai, the first Pentecost, they said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, we can do that." Is that all you want me to do? <laughs> we can do that. And then, within a very short space of time, they were worshiping idols again and falling for every trick that the world could throw at them. And uh, in the end, God said, you remember halfway, I always think of sort of hinge passages in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, particularly Ezekiel 36, where God says, well, I tell you what, if I, I see now, you, you can't do it on your own. So I will provide the spirit inside the inside of you to, to give you the ability to do, to keep. Mm. And, and I often think, I often think that that's what lies behind the story of the wedding feast. God has done everything to provide for us the spirit, the ability, the um, desire to to do what he calls us to do. And he calls us to do Mm. it not just to sort of as a whim on his part, but because um, it's good for us. Mm. That's what it's like, you know, we think we know what's best for our children. And um, so we uh, discourage them from certain things, like putting their fingers in the electric points, and we encourage them to do other things that will be a blessing to them. Hmm. Let's go into some questions out of that. So where is your love for Jesus made you want to keep a command that you did not before? And where is obedience challenging for you at the moment? So Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. And then he immediately goes into talking about how he's going to help us do it. I've heard it said he places his order and then he pays his bill. Um, (laughs) And um, can you talk to us a little bit about, because in the message translation, it it calls it, um, he says, I'm going to send a friend. Because I think we can often kind of sort of, sideline the Holy Spirit into a power but he's a he's a person mm. and he's a friend can you talk to us a little bit about 
what it is to have a friend who helps. Well, I think I think last night I mentioned something that Luther used to say very very strongly about, and he for some reason he said it was easier for young people to catch on to what he was trying to say. The, the devil's always trying to persuade us that if God gets us, it will be the worst for us, hmm. and it's good for him because he's something he wants us to do. Hmm. And it's so far from the truth that this language like friend, uh, teacher, encourager. It all shows that Jesus actually is not any of those things. He's, a, as Luther puts it, a justifier and a saviour. So he comes, wherever he comes, he comes to save, to improve, to, to make life better. Hmm. And how long it takes us in our lives to realise that the influence of the Spirit of God is good for you or for others or around us, particularly in meetings like we had, say, yesterday, if God says, it hasn't got to be a huge dramatic thing, but if God says, you see that man over there, um, why don't you go and pray for him? You can either say, Lord, I'm tired, I, you know, I, I've had enough and I really want to go. Well, uh, he, 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 he may make an issue of it. I prayed with someone last night in your church uh, who I hadn't noticed before until nearly very near the end. Mm. And I went over and prayed for him, and he said to me, the Lord told me that you were going to come and pray for me. Well, it's, it's such a combination of, mm. of, of things. And, I, uh, and always for the benefit of the, of the people, even though they may not see it at the time. Mm. You said something about um, Jesus. It's, it's, I suppose... It, we often talk about God wanting to use us. And you say God does not want to use you, but wants to love you and involve you. Mm. And I suppose it's that use feels like such a blunt word. Isn't yes. It? And you told us this. Can you tell us the story about um, the Polish prime minister who <laughs> had been a pianist before he became a, a, a leader of a country? You don't know that story? I've, no, I, no I, I think it was the first time I heard it last I night. I believe it's true. I believe it's true. He... he uh, Jan Paderewski, he was the uh, Prime Minister of Poland and, and um, a concert pianist. And uh, the story goes that this uh, dear woman had a son, a five-year-old boy, who she, she was trying to encourage to learn the piano, play the piano. So she decided to take him to this concert. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got there earlier and they were sitting in the stall, sitting there, and she got talking to the person next to her and, they, and totally failed to notice that the boy had disappeared. <laughs> And uh, then the lights went down and she, mm, she couldn't find her son anywhere at all <laughs> until the curtains went past and there was her son sitting at the grand piano uh, and playing and began to play uh, the only tune he knew, which was Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And um, the story goes that, uh, that Jan, who was coming onto the stage obviously to play the pieces that he was going to play, um, crept up behind him and... and and, and said to him, don't stop, keep playing, don't stop, keep playing. He then, with each hand on either side of the boy, started playing the arpeggios yeah. and the accompaniment and making the tune into the, something wonderful and beautiful and, um, and, and perfect. And uh, it, it was a sort of illustration, isn't it, in a sense, of the way the Spirit comes alongside us. There's a slight difference because the Spirit comes actually into us. Mm. But by, by this way... He turned what was a, a simple offering and contribution, but it did require the small boy to keep playing. Mm. And it's the same with us in the Spirit. We have to keep going, but by involving the Holy Spirit and making sure that we're at the center of his will insofar as we can, then we ensure that the result is a blessing to everybody else. Mm. And, of course, in the end, because if you think about it, to be invited to cooperate with the creator of the universe <laughs> is a huge privilege. Yeah. And um, if we fail to see that, then we have fallen for the devil's lie, yeah. which is that God wants to get you and spoil you. Uh, I remember thinking when I was start at university, because it was before I was converted, in that true sense, well, I used to go to church, of course, every um, at school we had chapel every day and twice on Sunday. But it, it never occurred to me, it didn't sink in, in, in the same way. But at university, I, I picked up the impression, I'm sure wrongly, that... that the Christians were more, most easily identified by what they don't do. Mm. They didn't do any of the things that I, were perfectly harmless things, it seemed to me. But, um, and I, I quite see it, I think that's, that's quite wrong. Either they were wrong or I was wrong, and I think probably I was wrong. Mm. 
But the fact is, they're much better identified by what they do do. Mm. <laughs> and what they do do is listen to the Lord regularly, taking in Bible teaching and, um, and encouragement, building themselves up, um, fueling themselves, as it were, um, on, the, on the grace and the power of God. Mm. And then, um, then they're noticed by what they do do. Um, mm. You know, I quoted Tertullian, you remember in the second century, mm. I think he was, who was so impressed. He wasn't remotely Christian, but... Uh, but he noticed, see how these Christians love one another. Yes. And it was there it was well known all over the world, that because the Roman civilization didn't, didn't revolve around love. It was force and pain. And hmm. Should we um, discuss that a bit? The, um, it's just shocking, isn't it? He said they've spent for three years helping Jesus. And he says, now you're going to go do it, and my spirit's going to help. Help you! It's such a such a surprise. Let's talk a little bit about that. Where do you need help from the helper? First of all, secondly, where has obedience helped you rely on His love, or rely more on His love? And what are some of the truths that the Holy Spirit has brought home to you? That last question comes because. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Mm. And I immediately went, was like, oh, I can't handle the truth. And and I think sometimes you can, well, I tend to go, oh, God, gosh, God's going to come. And he's immediately going to start with challenge. But obviously in, in Romans 8, which we also talked about yesterday, that the first thing it seems the spirit does is say, no, you're my, my child. Um, do you think that's the first thing? Uh, what's the, is there an order to how the spirit brings conviction and then, confirmation and then well i i think it's all linked dan you will know this as well as not better than i do but i think it's all linked god created us as social animals mm. and uh, to me that small group that kinship group whatever you call it whatever the language is that middle-sized group um the celebration group is wonderful for celebrating god but it's very hard to make friends mm. and i think we each need a group into which we can be totally open with one another and and can begin to share our understandings of what you know discernment is one of the hardest things in the christian life mm. you know you wake up and you have a right idea what is that from god or is that from me or is did i have too much to eat last night or is it whatever it is and a little group we can say hey wait a minute dan let's think about that we'll pray about that we'll talk about that have you thought about this have you thought about that and together in that mm. community then you can begin to discern and I think if it's of God, I often think if you're leading times of ministry and things, you think when I have an idea, um, uh, what about this? Um, uh, it's a good idea to throw it back to God, as it were, and say, Lord, is that you? And if it is, it, it'll come back again. And if it's not, it probably won't. Mm. It'll get absorbed in the atmosphere and disappear. But discernment is very hard, and mm. that's why I think we need one another. Mm. Uh, both uh, because sometimes the painful situations are so painful we can't, we can't see clearly at mm. all, and um, uh, and that's where I think the understanding of Scripture comes in, um, because I think most people think, don't they, that the house churches, that the house, the church in the house of that Paul talks about, were about uh, twenty people, fifteen, twenty people, the smaller group like, like that, um, which was the manifestation of the Spirit of God working through a community mm. in that particular area. Mm. So, um, you know, we mess up, of course we mess up, but we have the opportunity to start again, as it were, by realizing that God is not against us. He's entirely on our side. Mm. And um, I just think it's so kind of mm. Jesus to make this provision for his people, because he knew, you know, he starts, his, you remember, he starts that chapter, do not let your hearts be troubled. Well, mm. why would he say that? Their hearts were deeply troubled. <laughs> because he was about to leave, and yeah. said, well, all of us would be. But he knew that, mm. and he understood it. And instead of saying, you know, cheer up, cheer up, he says, I, I made provision for that, mm. all of that. And my provision is, I'll talk to the Father, and the Father will send the Spirit. And then, as you know, the church had great difficulty in, in, in understanding that the Spirit was actually divine. Mm. It took, I think, 100, 200 years, something like 380, something like that. Constant, you know, you know, but the ecumenical um, conference that they all got together, at, um, 
uh, uh, settled it finally. So we've settled that now. He is divine. And um, it was actually the experience of the Spirit that led to them trying to work out the theology. Hmm. Uh, and it doesn't work the other way around, I don't think. And I think that's why I think we need to make sure why Alpha is so important is that people can experience the love of God. Hmm. Otherwise, if Alpha is just another course, there are plenty of courses. But I think its great appeal and attraction and effectiveness is that we get an experience of the love of God. Then we can sort of work out what is actually going on, <laughs> which is that God is at work in three parts, Father, Son, and hmm. Comforter. Friends. So he comes as a comforter, and then he immediately gives you a reason that you need comfort, because he says to them, the world cannot accept him, the Holy Spirit, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I, I've heard you say that the, the flesh doesn't like the things of the Spirit, and there's a sort of resistance in us that comes from the world, but also comes internally as well. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that battle that can sort of come and go can seem fiercer at times than others how do we uh, how do we navigate um well i think without the without the influence of the spirit we are um almost um uh, almost uh, um i was going to say incurably self-obsessed hmm. everything revolves around us and, and that's why the illustration of young, uh, very young children is, is a very good one. Cause, and it's perfectly acceptable in young children and infants. All they think about is themselves. When am I getting my next food? Why am I being left alone? What, what about me, 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 me? But if by the age of 27 or 28 we're still saying me, 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 then there's something very wrong in the way we've been brought up. Because yeah. we ought to be beginning to say, what about you, 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 and other people, and how can the people around us, and how can I respond? And that's the influence of the Spirit, of course. Yeah. Because um, the Spirit will enable us to do things that are counterintuitive, hmm. often, um, to our own selfishness. Hmm. And um, it's the selfishness that Jesus comes to, to counter, because he was the, the model of unselfishness. Always thinking of other people. Hmm. And, and what shocked me about this was you were talking about he lives with you and in you. And that, that abide remains is the same way John the Baptist speaks of the spirit re remaining on Jesus. Hmm. So the, the spirit, like, like you said earlier, that it's, the, it's another, it's the same, the same helper, similar to Jesus. Everything we see in Jesus is, is who the Holy Spirit is. Um, but that does mean we're challenged and misunderstood at times. Yeah. How, how do you deal with that? Or how have you um, and Annette dealt with that when you're misunderstood as you're trying to follow the Holy Spirit? Well, you may not be able to. Hmm. It, it, um, I think um, it, it, it's a whole way... Uh, the relationship with Jesus seems to me something changed uh, John the Baptist required people to repent before they could be baptized and, uh, uh, Jesus doesn't always do that I mean, for, to Matthew he just says follow me hmm. and in following Jesus then Matthew discovers the truth of life with the spirit and changes his life hmm. because of it because in the light of his experience with Jesus. But it's that way around. So off, mm -hmm. It's the same with the prodigal, as you know, the prodigal son in Luke 15. He comes to his senses, he comes to the father. The father doesn't insist on him repenting. Mm -hmm. He let his father down very badly. The father really is away to it. We've got to have some understanding before you're going to come back into home like this, because mm -hmm. really you've let us all down and we've lost a lot of money and we've become, you know, laughing stock of the and all that stuff. He doesn't say that at all. He just puts his arms around him and hugs him and kisses him and things. Now, the result of that, I suspect, is that the son thought, oh, I've let go mm -hmm. dad down very badly. And, and the response is, an, uh, is a renewing of the relationship and getting closer again to Jesus. And that's what the way Jesus works. And that's why the world, I think, Jesus, Jesus never insists he could knock us on the head and say, get into heaven and stop complaining. And, 
He doesn't want to do that. He wants us to be like we do with our children. Uh, I mean, we've got grown up children. I, I can't any longer force them to come home. But I hope they'll come, and they do, which is lovely. And they come because I think they want to. And they feel, mm, I suppose they feel that they can do more for us now. And we did quite a lot for them in the early days when they were children. And it's that way that it works. Um, it, it draws a response from us. But the world doesn't understand that. And they'll misunderstand. That's why, again, we need a small group to be encouraged by. So we can say. But for example, if there are times when you feel that the Lord is calling you to do something, well, you 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 have to make that discuss it and pray about it and share it and things but the time may come particularly in church leadership the church uh, the time may come when you have to say well i i really think this is what i am called to do and plant a church for example because <laughs> planting churches is counterintuitive mm. you lose a lot of good people a lot of givers mm. a lot of lovely and you're never going to see them again perhaps mm. possibly but at the end of the day, if that's what God's calling you to do, it'll, it'll come again and again and again. And then looking back, you will see how God put everything in position. But you don't necessarily see it straight away because Jesus wants us to work by faith and um, understanding and hmm. it's all of that. Hmm. I don't know if that's, if that's what you meant. I think that's um, going to give us a lot to talk about. So where has your following of Jesus meant that you are not understood or not accepted at the moment? As we finish, and before I um, ask you to pray for us, Sandy, Jesus gives us this last um, sort of promise. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Um, you talked a little bit yesterday about before the foundation of the world. I think it's in Ephesians. Jesus had us in mind. Um, and why do you think, I mean, it's quite a particular word to use, isn't it, orphans? Mm. He could have said, I won't leave you as helpless workers. Mm. Or mm. Why do you think he speaks so often about um, being children and not being orphans? And why, why do you think he picks that kind of language? Well, because the plan, God's plan from before the creation. He, he, Paul repeats it in Colossians, as you know, very vividly, angels upon angels upon angels. Uh, and, and there are huge plans, which we find mind-boggling, actually to think that you were in the... Um, well, I think orphans, I suppose, I don't know if language changes, but I think what he means by that is that, that you feel parentless mm. because you haven't got any um, parents. Well, God never intended that. He always intended to be our father. And um, as you may remember, the first thing he said to Nicodemus is, you must be born from above. Born from above means the Spirit of God has enrolled you into the family of God at your request, and, and you become a child of God. Mm. And a child of God, um, has a, uh, you're not born into the spiritual world without a father. Mm. And the church, of course, as Paul says in Galatians, is your, act as your mother. So that um, Mothering Sunday is not actually <laughs> Mother's Day, it's Mothering Sunday celebrating the role of the church in bringing us from infanthood to maturity, mm -hmm. teaching us and encouraging us and mm -hmm. protecting us and training us why we need it so that we become the men and women of God that God created us to be. I, it's so important for us in our cultural moment at the moment because I think the individualism that we celebrate so much means that you've, you, you end up you have to work it all out yeah. you, you have to work it out you're abandoned to figure yes. out who you are <laughs> how you should behave what what's right and wrong and it's it's over i think it's overwhelming for people it's it's crushing um what, what do we do or what do you do when you have those moments where we fall for the lies and we think we've, we're acting like an orphan or we're feeling a bit orphaned what what do you do in those moments well i think we go back to scripture Go back to the to, to the to the word because uh, you know I've lived through a time when the Christian Church was sort of um, arguing about the, the Spirit and the Word, mm. but actually <laughs> what we sometimes forget is that Jesus is the Word. Mm. There's no distinction there. 
he's also um, the one who asked the Father to bring the Holy Spirit. So, and what the Spirit does, which is why he's self-effacing himself, is simply represent to us the influence um, and example that Jesus said. So there's no conflict there at all. We must go back to the Scriptures. And at the end of the day, that's why the Scriptures are so important. At the end of the day, uh, we see uh, what it was that the early church believed and died for. And many, many of them, of course, were martyred in those days for the faith. And as Paul says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we're all, we can all pack up and go home. It's, it's the end of the story. Yeah. But he did, and hundreds of people saw him. So why should we not accept their testimony? Particularly, as there's so much evidence of the life of the Spirit in the world today. Mm. So we have to come back to that again, um, not just on the experience, but on the scriptures, the living word, the mm. understanding, the teaching. Because these were real people who taught. Yeah. And real churches that grew and... Um, uh, and then as we read the scripture and Jesus and the influence that the spirit Jesus has left us uh, is a teacher hmm. to teach us and encourage us then things begin to make sense again and that's why again I, I, I go on about it but I think a small group is so important um, Annette and I had a small group throughout the time at Holy Trinity and I could have said anything to them because they were very discreet and very encouraging and very supportive and I could have said, I'm sick and tired of the whole thing and I'm not coming to church on Sunday. You can run it yourself and get on with it. And they'd have just said, oh, sit down, have a cup of tea and we'll pray for you. And then things begin to sort of fit more into context and you begin yeah. to think, actually, I do love going to church and seeing all these <laughs> lovely people. And I think I will go after all. <laughs> well, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you carried on. Um, that when it says the world cannot accept it because it doesn't see him, that... Um, the word there is to sort of focus on, to concentrate. Um, it's the way you get the root for theatre. So going mm. and sitting and watching and mm. and seeing, as you said, the work of the Spirit in the world. Um, would you pray for us Love that we to. could have eyes to see what the Spirit's doing, but also that we'd be filled afresh? And um, yeah, would you pray for us and then we'll pray for each other in our groups? Father, we thank you for this loving and lovely community here. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to raise up godly men and women who can be a blessing to one another, of course, but a blessing above all else to you, Father. Mm. We pray for Dan and Kate as they lead this community. Put a wall of fire around them and all who are members of this community, Lord, a wall of fire that they can be guided and taught and encouraged and set free, not to try really to be Christians, but just to be, that your name may be glorified and that the world may see that there is a, a, a loving community of Christian people who love God and who are loved and blessed by them. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, continue to do that and be shine upon you and be gracious to you and the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace Amen 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 Sandy thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and um, no wisdom at all thank you <laughs> have a really good time praying for each other and uh, see you on Sunday have a great week God bless <laughs>